All right, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, so this talk is titled uh, Eclipse Microprofile, a quest for a lightweight and modern enterprise Java platform. Uh, so the, the kind of thrust behind that talk uh, title is um, really kind of a reference to some of the criticisms that have been thrown at um, enterprise Java in the past, that it's not particularly light or particularly modern. Um, and really that's where Microprofile com came from. So that's the kind of context that I want to do this talk in. Um, there's a lot to cover because um, there's been a lot that's been happening. My profile is a very fast-moving project. So what I'm hoping to do is cover as much of it as I can. Um, potentially, if, if there's time, um, there'll be a demo. It's not crucial to the talk, um, but it'd be nice to show you some things as well. So um, what we're going to talk about is first I'll cover what my profile is as a project, uh, why you should care about it. Uh, next, I'll look at how do you get it, um, what implementations there are, and um, all the rest. Then I'll um, give an overview of what APIs you get. Um, and then finally, the, the biggest part will be how do you use them. So I'll kind of look at each API in turn, um, a little bit of the features that you can get from it, um, and hopefully inspire you to get started with MicroProfile if you haven't already. Uh, so at this stage, can I have a show of hands? Who's heard of the MicroProfile? project before. Okay, so uh, hands up people who just don't really know what it is at all. Okay, good. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I hopefully won't spend too long on it. So MicroProfile at its heart is um, a collection of APIs in the same way that you know, Java EE is a collection of APIs. Um, it is focused on, but it is far from limited to microservices. So um, the inspiration behind most of the APIs has been uh, deploying things into a microservice architecture, um, but many of the APIs you can just use in um, any sort of cloud environment, uh, and we'll see that as we go along as well. Uh, it's a place for innovation. So again, as I said, the, um, one of the main things that's been thrown at uh, Java the language as well as um, Java EE, for instance, uh, is that it's slow to innovate. Um, most innovations come from things that have been well established, then get folded into the main project for stability reasons. Um, so Microprofile is a place to try new things, have a look at what works, give developers uh, the tools that they need to operate in the modern world, um, and then see um, how quickly we can develop these things and push those into uh, a more stable supported platform. Uh, and finally, it's community driven. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit at the end about how everyone in this room can get involved, either just as an end user, you don't have to contribute if you don't want to. Um, but the uh, the bar to contribute to MicroProfile is, is set deliberately as low as possible, so everyone can have a voice uh, in the direction of MicroProfile. So what should you care? Um, I think it's it's really important to be involved in the future of Enterprise Java if you are a user of it in any way. Um, again, for a third time, um, things have been perceived as slow in the past. Microprofile is designed to be fast. So um, there have been uh, three uh, releases since it uh, started so far. Um, one of the specs that has started purely in Microprofile has already had a second release. Uh, and there are maintenance releases um, already going on, and another three that are in development. Um, so if you want to um, help shape the future and direction, um, you can get involved now. Uh, and maybe due to your influence, you'll get to see some of the tools that you want to use in your, um, uh, in your day jobs. Uh, and generally just as a user for, for your application. So um, I did a talk at Java 1 earlier this year where one of the main points I made was that between Java E7 and Java E8, you might think that nothing has happened, but there have been tons and tons of innovation that's happened as a result of vendors um, as a, across all of them. So Red Hat, IBM, uh, Tommy Tribe and, and Pyara, we've all kind of come up with new ways of doing things aside from just the specs. So the tech landscape is changing and changing rapidly. Um, and Microprofile aims to give you like a new toolbox uh, to take best advantage of all that stuff. So how do you get it? This is just a list of implementations. Um, obviously, Pyro Micro is the, the Pyro one. Uh, Tommy have got their um, implementation, so a lot of the um, Apache projects that are going to be folded into there. Um, I'll talk about that a bit later as well. Wildfly Swarm um, is Red Hat's implementation. 
Uh, Open Liberty is IBM's now fully open source implementation. Um, they've got a booth downstairs. I'm sure they'll be happy to tell you more about that. Um, I know actually on, on a micro profile perspective, they've got a very good um, guide online that shows um, in depth how the circuit breaker pattern can be used. And I really would recommend checking that out on um, openliberty.io. Uh, Kamula Z uh, is a small um, Java e, um, implementation. Uh, so they've, I think, managed to implement all of the micro profile specs except for JWT. Last time I checked a couple of weeks ago, um, maybe they've done that since. And finally, Hammock, uh, which is a um, CDI-based uh, uh, REST microservices platform. Uh, and Hammock, I think, implements all of the microprofile specs. So what APIs do you get? Uh, with Microprofile 1.0, all of the ones that you see over there in orange were released. Now, that's just CDI, JSON, P, and JAXRS at the same level as Java EE7. Um, so the idea there was to pick the three... Um, most minimal set of APIs that you could use to develop a microservice on. Uh, it was deliberately as small as possible. Um, we didn't want to kind of guess at a few other things. We wanted to start with a, a really, really minimal set and then adapt as we went forward. The, the one in bright blue there, config 1.1, that was the very first API that was completely developed almost in-house, in you might say, in the microprofile project that involved people from IBM, from Red Hat, from Pyara, uh, from the community, um, from Apache as well. Um, and I, I think it was a, a big success. I, I really enjoyed using it myself. Um, I used it in a couple of demos already. Um, and currently, in, in the current release, that's already had a further uh, maintenance release, which is um, actually 1.1 does in introduce uh, a small new feature that I'll mention later. The paler blue ones are the second set of uh, APIs that have all been introduced in 1.2. That's uh, Health Check, which uh, allows you to see whether a service is up or down. Metrics, which gives you specific details about things that you care about in your application. Uh, fault Tolerance, which implements um, fault tolerant design patterns. That you might be familiar with if you've looked at any of, um, sort of Netflix's open source libraries. Uh, and JWT propagation, um, which is about kind of security token uh, exchange. Uh, now, in the future, um, these are the things that are coming. Um, the diagrams there are a little bit old. So the current target for MicroProfile 1.3, just targeted to Q4, so you know, um, I think the end of this month, perhaps, there is Open Tracing 1.0. Open tracing is a, an open standard that's implemented by things like Zipkin or Jaeger. Uh, if you ever used any of those to do distributed tracing among microservices or, or disparate um, systems, um, that's on its way. It's being developed at the moment. Uh, open API, some of you might be more familiar with as Swagger. Um, so again, we've got people um, from the Open API um, group. I, th I think SmartBear actually uh, wanted to join MicroProfile at one point. Uh, I think they've already made that announcement. Uh, and finally, the TypeSafe REST client, which is not on the um, picture there, um, which is just a, a TypeSafe way of consuming REST services. So that will be in, hopefully, in, in 1.3. Now, MicroProfile is a time-boxed release, so if they're not ready yet, they won't make it in, and they'll just get pushed back to the next uh, release. Uh, what will happen, though, is MicroProfile 2.0, 2 which is effectively just bumping up the, the version of all of the Java EE8 inherited specs and then folding in the um, Java EE8 JSONB spec. Uh, it's already been kind of decided and, and agreed that that's going to happen. Uh, and I think the current target from the Google group was uh, Q1 next year. So we should see that very, very soon. Uh, other things that we'll see as well is just maintenance releases. So... In implementing a lot of these specs, uh, there are certain kind of small changes that needed to make to the TCK or to the uh, spec document to fix typos and things. So those will happen in maintenance releases as well. Uh, and yeah, just to underline that fact, that's all unconfirmed at the moment. So um, let's dive right into the actual APIs. So this is config 1.1, and most of this really will apply to 1.0 as well. Um, so just an overview, this API was originally developed uh, so that you could inject config values at runtime. So the use case for this would perhaps be uh, moving from 
development to a test to a prod environment. Maybe you wanted to uh, include uh, particular settings in your CI system. So uh, perhaps Jenkins could uh, set some system properties and then you could inject all those at runtime. Uh, it is not a registry. So this was something that I, I tried to use for a demo uh, and then asked the guys about how I would implement it, um, where I basically wanted to create a few microservices, but if I didn't know ahead of time what the URL of my dependent services would be, could I then write them to the um, config source and then read them from my other uh, service? That's not how it works. Uh, values are read-only by design. But you can specify your own config source. And by specifying your own config source, uh, you can implement uh, a method to set a config value. Um, that's perfectly okay, that's perfectly acceptable, and there are built-in ways for you to do that. So uh, the reason why it's not in included in the actual config API itself is because it kind of uh, leaves the scope of config. It's, it's more for a service registry rather than a config API. Uh, and there are ordinals um, for priority. So if you wanted to set um, like default um, config source values, you can then override those with um, config sources with a higher ordinal. Uh, there are a few default ones. So there are um, microfile-config.properties files that you can include in your um, one file area file in the meta inf directory. Uh, that's got the lowest ordinal. Um, so then obviously the higher the ordinal number, the higher the priority. Uh, environment variables will then overwrite those. And then finally, system properties can overwrite those. Uh, system properties I find the easiest to use anyway. Uh, now, each implementer is free to and probably will implement their own um, default config sources per implementation. So to find out those, obviously, you'll need to go to the implementation um, website, so Open Liberty, Wildfly Swarm. Just as an example, here's um, Pyaras, which will, if anyone's uh, used Pyara before, you'll probably be familiar with some of those. Um, so we've got like the config one that I highlighted there. That's I think the most misleading. So for each server instance in Pyara, each server instance has its own config. So really we put in a config in, in a config. So um, if you <laughs> um, if you wanted to um, use that, you're, you're very welcome to. And that's kind of completely native. But if you are a Pyara user, that might be more comfortable for you. So this is how you use it in your code. Um, really, really simple. At inject and at config property. Uh, there are two... Um, uh, properties that, that you can set on that name and default value. So just in, in the example there, you can see at the top, we've got um, a string injected uh, with example.sum.url. Now, the problem there, obviously, is that we're not setting a value in the code either. So if, for whatever reason, that config source was not loaded properly or just wasn't set there in your um, CI program, that would cause problems. So to get around that, we've got a couple of ways around that. Um, you can either inject it to an optional uh, and then handle what if it's not there, in that, that case. Or you can just set a default value actually in the code itself, uh, which is the, the final one there, using the default value annotation. There are built-in converters as well, um, which obviously adds a little bit of type safety. Uh, these are all automatic, so you can um, uh, inject a config property as a, as a URL type directly, you don't have to inject it as a string and do your own conversion. That's all done for you. Uh, now, one of the things that came in config 1.1 is that URL converter. So it's not there in 1.0, but it is in, in 1.1. And finally, if you did want to um, implement your own custom config source, this is how you can do it. Uh, implement this config source interface uh, with those few methods. Again, if you wanted to write to it, you could just add your own set value and set name methods. Uh, now, that would be okay for a single config source to use the java.util.serviceloader method. Um, but the alternative, if you've got sort of multiple config sources, maybe you've got a properties file that you wanted to implement in many different jar files and you need to load all of them to get the full picture, you can use a config source provider, which will let you load multiple sources. Let's move on to health check. Um, I'm trying to rush through this a little bit. There's a lot of stuff to do. Um, simple annotations. It's a really simple API, this, um, but I think really, really useful. Um, just annotate things with at health, and it will automatically give you a um, up or down uh, status. 
Now, this is deliberately just up or down. There's no kind of like warning or, or threshold level that was discussed. Um, but really, the use case for this is when you're in a microservices style um, architecture in, in the cloud, really what you want to know is, is this um, up and is it serving requests? If not, then I'll kill it and then just start a new one. So that that's really what it's there for. Obviously, you may want to know ahead of time if it's getting close to dying. And if it is, then we can still specify extra data and you can handle that in your own way. So it's, to be honest, after having looked at it, I think actually it's more flexible in this way. So here's an example. This is, uh, we've annotated a class with at health. Um, now, when you do that, you need to also implement the health check interface and then override the call method, which returns a health check response. So there you can see we've got health check response dot named disk space. Um, and this will just kind of tell you, is it, um, have we got no disk space left? But also we're adding a dot with data to tell you how much is free. Um, now obviously that's just a standard key value pair. So you could maybe um, implement it as a percentage, say, oh, uh, it's 95% full, that's bad, and then handle it in your monitoring software, which I think is really the, the better place to handle that sort of thing. So that that's it really for, for health checks. Um, obviously there is more stuff in the uh, spec documents and we'll we'll get to that later. But here we'll look at Metrics 1.0, which is a, a really closely related uh, API. So there are many different kinds of annotations for metrics. Um, this is just kind of like to make it a little bit more easy for you for you to use things. You don't have to use the annotations. There is a programmatic way to do it as well, which I, I won't go into. Um, anyone here who's used something like Prometheus? Yeah, a couple of users. So for, for you, you, you might recognize some of these annotations. Um, these were kind of inspired by Prometheus, but you, obviously you don't have to use that to, uh, to read metrics. Um, counters obviously can go... Um, generally show you totals. Uh, a gauge kind of goes up and down. Um, a meter is going to show you um, kind of throughput and th things like that. Uh, timed, obviously, just timings. And at metric allows you to um, kind of in inject these things in a programmatic kind of way. So let's look at each of them in turn. Uh, counted has a property called monotonic. This is the only one with its own specific um, property. If monotonic is set to false, which is the default, you can see in the comment there, it will only count current invocations. So as soon as the method finishes, it will then subtract one from the counter. So the, the count that you're getting is only things that are currently within that method. So for instance, if you call out to a remote service and that takes some amount of time, um, the default behavior is it will only show you things that are currently in that method and currently running. If you set that to true, then it will just simply add to the counter and it will just give you like a high watermark of how many times that's been called. Uh, and that annotation can be added on constructors, methods, and types, basically on, 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 the, on the classes. Uh, and when you actually annotate a type, each of the different um, methods will be annotated for you. So you, you don't need to do that all on every single method. Uh, now, gauge, uh, this requires you to set a unit, but um, th this is something that is applicable to every single um, metric as well. So now the units are, for, for metrics, they are encouraged. You don't have to do it for everyone. Gauge, you do. Uh, and the reason for that is because um, it, it adds so much uh, extra value to have that kind of metadata about what you are uh, measuring. Um, so we've got this enum called metric units. If you've got something that's just a random value and there's, it doesn't make sense to measure it in, say, megabytes or days or seconds or whatever, uh, you can just use metric units dot none. Uh, metered, uh, again, like I said, this uh, produces kind of mean throughput. You'll get like a one, five, and 15 minute moving average. Um, same as before, you can annotate this on constructor method or type. Um, and basically, it'll just tell you um, what kind of throughput you're getting uh, in something like Prometheus or, or a dashboard. Uh, timed, this will give you uh, 
uh, just du duration statistics. Uh, this kind of is useful when you kind of combine it with things like the fault tolerance API, where you might have a specific timeout. You might want to do this to see how long various different methods take um, in dev, test, and prod, and then use that to feed into the data that you, uh, the value that you want to put for your timeout on that method, just to stop you putting the timeout too low or something. Uh, and at metric, now this can be added on a field method or parameter, so this is different to the previous ones that we've seen. Um, and obviously this one is where we are annotating a, um, uh, a particular gauge. Um, we have had to override the getValue method of gauge uh, and then return whatever we want. Um, so this kind of gives you a little bit more flexibility in the way that you're using metrics and the way that you are supplying your own metrics. And here's just a list of all of the fields that are available. Um, like I said, counted is the only one with the extra one, that monotonic at the top. But all the others have a uh, name, uh, whether or not they're absolute, uh, display name, which is going to be the, the thing that's uh, picked up by something like uh, Prometheus or, or Grafana or, or whatever. A description, which uh, again gets picked up in the um, if you view things in a, a browser. Uh, unit and tags. Tags just there to give you um, an option uh, to supply some extra data. So these metrics get exposed in three different registries. So it's everything is on um, your URL slash metrics. Um, they are there's base, application, and vendor. Base is the minimum required by every single microprofile implementation. Um, but then there's also application, which is where any th annotation that you were to put on in your app would go. Uh, and if you were, for instance, to deploy multiple applications, that's thought of as well. So each of those things, for example, hit count there, that would be prefixed with the context root of your application, because that's something that we know is unique. And finally, vendor. Um, this is something that can be implemented by whoever's implementing the spec, whether it's Pyara, IBM, uh, Red Hat, Tommy. Um, this data can be exposed in JSON format that you can see there, but also Prometheus text format. So like I say, we we did use Prometheus a lot to uh, to test this out and to make sure it worked, um, just because it's so ubiquitous these days, and particularly that the text format is being used by other different products. Um, so it just gives you a bit of extra flexibility there. Um, obviously, the JSON format means that you, you're really not tied into Prometheus at all. There's a sample YAML file. This, um, if we get time for the demo, this will be uh, part of it. Um, there is a demo application called the MicroProfile Conference app, which is available on GitHub under the Eclipse project. Um, this is a sample Prometheus.yaml that I literally I added this week specifically for this talk because uh, it's useful to use with it. So this is an example of connecting to um, a metrics running on Open Liberty. And the their implementation of it is secure by default. So obviously you need to supply a username and password, um, tell it to use HTTPS, and also tell it to um, ignore an insecure uh, verification because it's using self-signed certificates. Um, but obviously we don't need that for demo purposes. Okay, next one is fault tolerance. Fault tolerance is, I think, probably the biggest one. Uh, so there's, there's tons of stuff in, in fault tolerance and um, could easily um, bore you to death with another 50 minutes just about this. Um, so this basically implements common design patterns that you will have seen from um, things like the, the Netflix uh, open source libraries. Um, but they're, they're all ones that should be familiar to you if you are aware of fault tolerance. If you're not, I'll try and explain them a little bit as well. All of these annotations can be used together, but what I would say is it is important to check the spec on how they behave when they're used together. Because when um, certain of these annotations are triggered, they cause different behavior in some of the other ones. So uh, using them in combination, you do need to double check exactly what the behavior is that you're specifying. Uh, and I've, if you did want to look at these uh, slides, I will make them available, and that's a link so you can click and go directly to the spec. All of the specifications, I should say, are available on GitHub in the, pro in the GitHub repositories slash releases. So the first annotation is at asynchronous. This is kind of the simplest one. 
uh, effectively just means that you run that method um, or that class or every method in the class, I should say, in a separate thread. Um, if you are going to do that, you must return a future. If not, then an error will be thrown, uh, an exception will be thrown, I should say. And obviously, if you're not doing that, then all the requests, all those methods are just going to be treated synchronously. Next is uh, retry. So if something happens in your um, uh, service that kind of makes a, a failure happen, then you can use retry to say whether you want to try again, how many times you want to try again, what delays you want to add in. So I've listed those kind of in a grouped format. Um, but we'll, we'll start with the example on the bottom. So at the bottom, I've got public void service C, and I've got a retry on ioexception.class. And so for example, if I'm reading from disk, if, I, if that throws an IO exception, retry will pick that up and just immediately retry. We immediately, there'll be um, no delays or anything except for the, maybe the default delay, which is, I think, five milliseconds. Um, but that will just, uh, it's, it's a very simple use case, effectively. Going back up to the middle one, service B, I've got the writing service there that's being called. Um, now there we've got a max number of retries as 90, which is quite a few, and a max duration of five. And now I've overridden the duration unit with chrono unit dot seconds. Uh, I think chrono unit's the, the default for the duration unit there. Uh, now do note that that's a slightly different name. It's, it's not like max duration unit, which is what I was expecting as I wrote this down. Um, it is duration unit, so obviously make sure that um, the thing that you're using is the thing that you think it is. Okay. Um, now the top one uh, is the most uh, kind of complex, comprehensive one. Um, looking at service A there, we've got four different uh, properties that we're setting. So here there is a delay of uh, 400 milliseconds because we haven't specified any different units. A max duration of 3200 milliseconds so that would be um that would effectively give you uh four retries minimum so that the maximum duration is the maximum duration of any single request so if it happens um for kind of 3200 milliseconds then it will stop and then it will start again with a delay of 400 jitter is quite interesting so jitter will just um, use that 400 and it will either subtract or add 400 to the delay so that delay, rather than being 400 now, is either 0 or 800. Okay. And then there's a max retries equals 10. So we want to you know, keep things reasonable. We're just setting a hard limit of 10 on the max retries there. Next, we've got uh, fallback. So obviously, if you find that something has retried a couple of times and still hasn't worked, then perhaps you want a fallback method. Maybe that fallback method is an alternative option, which is maybe not so great, or a second service, or maybe it's just something to uh, handle an exception and you know, feed back a nice, friendly error message. Um, so there are a couple of ways that you can do it. You can either specify a, a full class, uh, which implements fallback handler. So you can see there on the right hand side, um, we've got our fallback with string fallback handler dot class. Um, and that obviously needs to override the um, string fallback handler dot handle method. Uh, and that will be the, the method that's used um, to handle that particular uh, failure. Now that's something if you want to obviously implement a generic um, fallback, which just maybe returns uh, an error or something. On the left-hand side, we've got a particular fallback method. So just in the same class, we want to maybe try something different. Next, we've got Circuit Breaker. So if, if you're not familiar with Circuit Breaker, the idea is that um, based on certain properties, uh, we want to mark a, um, uh, a particular service as, as not being uh, available or mark the uh, method as being bad. So what the circuit breaker does is it will allow you to uh, pass through the circuit if it is closed, obviously because we're looking at electronics here, and if the circuit is open then that's bad and, and then uh, the uh, method will not complete. 
So this throws the circuit breaker open exception when the circuit is set to open, and that can then be handled by other different annotations, for example, fallback or uh, retry or something else. So if, just to say... Um, Example, you could use Circuit Breaker to throw this exception, have retry handle it after a delay of 400 milliseconds. There are a few different properties there. Uh, success threshold is uh, set to 10, request volume threshold 4, value ratio 0.75 and delay equals 1000. All of those together combine to give you the contract for whether or not this circuit should be open or closed. Um, it's pretty complex to kind of try, try and work this out in your head. At this point, I really would recommend looking at uh, Open Liberty's guide on the circuit breaker because it is, it does go into a lot of depth and we just, I'm running out of time here. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just move on from there. Bulkhead, um, if you're not familiar with Bulkhead, it's a way of um, isolating failures in a single part of an application. Uh, but effectively what it's doing here is giving you two different modes to control the amount of work done by that particular method. So there's a semaphore mode, which is kind of the simple mode, and a thread pool mode. The top one here in the example is using semaphore mode, and it's just adding a limit of five um, requests on that method. So kind of five simultaneous requests can happen on, on that method at any one point. The thread pool mode adds another different property called waiting task queue. So it will allow you to kind of queue up different requests to then um, execute in that method at a later date, uh, or later time, sorry, not date. Um, you need to use that with asynchronous. Um, it's not so clear in the spec that that's required, um, but it is It is something that I did double check and, and checked with uh, the Pyora um, guy who's going to implement it. And uh, yeah, it does need to be used with asynchronous. And obviously because it's use with asynchronous, we are returning a future connection there. And in thread pool mode as well, I should say, it throws a bulkhead exception if um, there are five concurrent requests and also the waiting task queue is full. Next we've got timeout, uh, another nice simple one straightforward. Timeout of 400, default in milliseconds, um, triggers either a fallback or a retry but also can contribute to opening a circuit. So even with that fairly complex circuit breaker um, pattern that we had before, if you add uh, a timeout to it as well, that can uh, kind of contribute to opening a circuit. I think the circuit can actually be in a state of being half open, which is where the um, it's just marked as being not quite healthy, but it's not fulfilled all of the criteria for being open. Okay, next is JWT propagation. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll have time for a demo. So um, pe people are all aware of JWT. It's, I think, fairly common these days. Yeah, good, good. Um, so it's token-based authentication, um, which obviously is the sort of thing that you would really need for RESTful microservices. Obviously, the, the reason for this is because it's validation is easy without having to do a second round trip to another kind of validation service. Uh, JSON formatted data is pretty easy to, to carry auth information and also to process, particularly since MicroProfile implements JSONP. Um, and there is an agreed set of standard claims for interoperability. I think it's the IANA um, who kind of sets... Um, global standard claims for, for JWT. Uh, you can obviously supply your own, but you know, one, of the, one of the key attractive things about JWT is that there is an agreed contract between different services, so it helps you with interoperability. So MicroProfile's implementation, um, tokens can be used for both authentication and authorization. They can be mapped to the JSR 375 identity store, which is again something coming in Java EE 8. Um, so, for example, if you were to run this on Pyro Micro, which had has Java E8 APIs in uh, or available, then we can use uh, Java E security um, for the identity store there. It does support additional IANA standard claims. So, obviously, there's a core set of standard claims by the IANA, but then there's some additional ones, which are kind of standard and agreed, but not guaranteed by everything. Microprofile, they are included. Um, 
but it will also support the um, additional non-standard claims, which uh, can be specified by um, by yourself in your applications. There's two new standard claims that have been added: uh, UPN user principle, um, which I think is different to JSR v seven five, which use caller principle, um, but effectively it's, it's the same um, meaning for that. And also groups, so it adds um, claims about the subject of the tokens group memberships, so um, like admin or manager or, or whatever. There's an example of a uh, microprofile compatible JWT token and the minimum required claims. So we've got type as JWT and algorithm as RS-256. I'm pretty sure those two are the, the mandatory ones. And then KID, which is just the ID of the, the key used um, to secure the token. Um, then further down, we've got a few other claims. I'll see, if, see how many I can remember. Uh, ISS is the issuer, uh, so that's the um, authority that issued the token. Um, expiry, EXP. Um, IAT is issued at a uh, time when the thing was actually issued. Um, sub, I think, is the subject, uh, so information about the subject that the token is about. And as I said before, uh, UPN, uh, user principle and groups, whatever groups that subject is in. Now in your code, um, there is the at claim annotation. Um, <laughs> when I went through the spec doc to get some nice examples of this, there is a massive, massive example. There are, there are tons of different uh, ways that you can use this with each of the different um, claims uh, having examples. So now the, the thing that I wanted to pick out from that is that I've got two uh, injected claims here. Uh, the top one has got a value of EXP, but I'm in trying to inject the standard claims that IAT. That will throw an exception, because um, it's, as I said in the second point there, it's ambiguous use. So that will throw a deployment exception because you're trying to inject uh, an issued at claim into the EXP uh, claim for the JSON token. So that won't work. Uh, and I've, again, I put a link there to the specification doc. So for the complete details, and, and there's quite a lot, um, please have a look at that. So next, I wanted to really highlight how you can actually find out more um, as a user, firstly. Um, so if you just want to get your hands on these tools, uh, first, you need to choose your implementation. So the ones that I listed earlier, not all of those are equal. As I said at the time, some of them support different um, APIs at the moment. The most thorough one is IBM's Open Liberty, which implements all of the Microfer 1.2 API. Um, so Pyro Micro, for instance, supports Microfer 1.1. 1.2 1 support is still being developed. Um, and I think that's the case for some of the others. I think Wildfly Swarm will support uh, certainly metrics and health checks. Um, but may, uh, and JWT propagation. Uh, I'm not sure if they've released config support just yet. They, they may have done uh, in the kind of past month or so. Uh, next thing to do would be to check the release notes. Um, if you go to the MicroProfile Bomb repository, so it's just eclipse slash MicroProfile dash bomb, uh, that will give you the um, kind of umbrella project release notes. It will tell you what's in each version and also give you, crucially, links to where you can find out about the different APIs that you get in there. But certainly check the release notes for the individual specs for just how to use them. They're super easy to read. Um, they're written by developers for developers. So if you want to get your hands on it and have a play, that's definitely the best place to start, certainly where I started. Uh, and finally, ask questions. So as I said before, uh, MicroProfile is a community effort. It's all about community. It's all about being very approachable. So each of the uh, specifications has a Gitter group, uh, which is, you know, is, is very closely tied to GitHub. Um, so you can go there and just ask a question about what the behavior is supposed to be if it's maybe ambiguous from the spec docs. Um, and then maybe you can file an issue or a, or a pull request for yourself. Uh, and also in the Google group. Now this is um, uh, where we do kind of most of the broad communication for the um, for the project. It can be a little bit overwhelming if you're not used to it because there's a lot to track and there's a lot of activity that goes on there. If you want to contribute to MicroProfile, and I really encourage you to do that, it's, as I said, the, the aim is that we're trying to set the barrier as low as possible so you can just 
stroll right in and say, you know, I've got opinions on how things should be um, and, you know, share those with people. If you are interested in an existing spec, so one of the ones that I've talked about today, or maybe uh, Open Tracing, Open API, which are currently in development and you can influence today if you'd like, find the repository on GitHub, um, find the chat community, which will be in the readme of those um, uh, repositories, um, but also find the Hangout in the MicroProfile calendar. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there you can actually talk on the phone and you know see what's going on. Um, you can participate as much or as little as you want. If you want to start something new, that's possible as well. So you can either start a discussion in the Google group just to see what other people's opinions are and start sharing things. Or if you are a hands-on type, you can just start coding right away. We've got the microprofile-sandbox repository where you can clone it, create a new pull request, um, and then that should be just merged very, very quickly so that um, uh, you can basically kind of contribute your ideas and get other people to give quick feedback on them. Right, uh, and just before I move on to the actual demo, what I wanted to do was show you a little bit about some of those resources. So here's the uh, MicroProfile Bomb spec that I've previously downloaded. Uh, so as you can see, the, there are links to the different uh, projects there. And there are different um, specs for each of them, each of them kind of differing sizes, but let's choose the metrics one because I know that's um, quite a good one. And there we can see an example of some of the uh, annotations, the annotated naming convention. So when you annotate something with at metric, you can decide exactly how it looks in the registry. So a super useful guide to, to get started with things. Hopefully if uh, I've still got internet access, I don't. If I did, that would be where Gitter would be. Um, and you can kind of get chatting with people there. There's also microprofile.io just got a few really useful links on it. So um, there's a projects page. I won't open that because it probably won't load. Yeah, it says that I've got no IP. Um, oh. um, there is a link to presentations, frequently asked questions, uh, a blog, uh, and also join the discussion, which will take you to here. This is the MicroProfile Google group. Um, you are free to just create any new topic you want, start discussing things, join in on some of the threads that are already there. Um, and finally, if you wanted to contribute, uh, this is the MicroProfile Wiki. This is the, the place to go. If you don't know where to get it from, just type in Eclipse MicroProfile Wiki. It's the top uh, result in Google. And here we've got loads of useful links. Um, so one of these is the MicroProfile Calendar, which looks like this. It's probably a little bit small, so let's zoom in. That's a list of all the different Hangouts that happen every week. Uh, if you're interested in a specification, get on that. There is uh, a general one that happens every two weeks, this MP Hangout. Uh, and that's something that everyone is invited to. Um, you're very welcome to come and just join and just sit on the call. You don't need to really say anything, um, but just see what's going on. Uh, maybe contribute some of your own ideas and things to how things should go. So I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to... Uh, have a go at a demo. So what I've done, uh, I won't show you absolutely everything, but what I've done is already cloned the microprofile-conference repository. This is the um, eclipse-microprofile-conference. Uh, the idea of this um, project was to uh, create something that uh, was a completely distributed application uh, one service per implementation, all of these work together to create a single application. I won't run it now because it takes quite a while to kind of build everything and then start all the applications and uh, it just takes a while. So rather than do that, I'm going to show you a particular uh, service. This is the Vote service. The reason why I've chosen that one is because it's the one that runs on Open Liberty. As I said before, Open Liberty implements all of the uh, APIs. So here, you can see what I've done is um, I've, I've actually made a change already to this uh, health check response call. If we go to the top of the class, you can see it's annotated with at health. It implements health check. Um, and what I've done is add this extra line. I've added some extra data. And what this class is, this is couch attendee DAO. 
This is because the uh, persistence part of this uh, application is running on Couchbase. Uh, the reason why IBM, I think, chose Couchbase is because they've got some quite good Cloud Foundry support for it in Bluemix. Um, but obviously, when you run it locally, it's not going to be there. So this is something that we want to have health reporting on. Now, what I've thought would be useful is to mix in the config API with this, because it's useful to know what URL you're trying to connect to. So what I've done is I've injected a config property with the name my DevOx URL and the, uh, the string name custom URL, and I've added that to the health check reporting with a dot with data. So now let's actually just check to see what's running. OK. Um, so I want. Uh, So I actually need to specify this as a system property. So I'll need to do minus D uh, my dot devox dot URL equals uh, let's just do fake dot URL. So now that system property we passed into the uh, vote microservice. You can see it's just a jar file there because Liberty, I think like all the implementations, uh, builds things into an Uber jar. That should start up. Good, that's ready. So now hopefully, if I go to the health endpoint, obviously it's running on, on the secure things, so I need to accept the default things. And we don't have the, <laughs> the change. Did I actually save it? I might not have done. Yes, I'll need to actually rebuild it. <laughs> um. Cool. So I'll, I'll leave that to, to build uh, and just show this. So this is the... Uh, let's make that bigger. This is what you will find if you go to the slash metrics endpoint. Uh, this here, I've gone to localhost colon 9443 slash metrics, uh, and this is the Prometheus text format output. So what we can see is we've got lots and lots of different um, uh, types here. These are all begin with base. But if we search for application, then we've got some, uh, like the hash map attendee DAO, uh, and we've got some uh, metrics there that have been added. So you've got one minute rate, five minute rate, and 15 minute rate. Uh, and then those can be read by Prometheus. I've still got a couple of minutes left. This is the Prometheus.yaml uh, config. And what I'll do here is um, start Prometheus. And hopefully, if I still had the URL. Ninety ninety, good. There we can see all of the uh, different metrics. Because I just picked one at random, that's probably not going to be one with a, an interesting graph. But they're, they're there and they're available. And I'm really, really running out of time now. Let's see if... OK, so that didn't work. Well, if I had built it, you can see uh, this is the, the data thing. And, and you would have seen in there, it would have injected the uh, config API. It worked when I uh, tried it earlier, just forgot to build it again. Uh, so there is 1 minute 30 left. so. Are there any questions? I've got a few guesses at questions. Is that, yep? Yeah. Um, uh, about the config API. The config? Uh, the config API. Right. Uh, is there a way to uh, inject a, uh, an object which holds all the properties instead of like injecting separate ones? Some, like Spring Boot has that. 
Okay, so it, um, the question was, is there a, a way to inject all of the properties rather than just you know injecting them one by one? Uh, so let's go back to the uh, config converters list. Uh, I'm going to say, no, not yet. Uh, it is still pretty new, though. Uh, discussions are still ongoing as to how to develop the specs. So what I would say, the best thing to do, raise an issue on the GitHub project, uh, get onto Gitter or on the Google group and, and make a suggestion. Uh, sounds like quite a good suggestion to me. Uh, so that would be a great one to have. Yes. There are two answers. Almost yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes, true. So just for those who didn't hear, you can write your own converter uh, and you could also inject a, a config object uh, and kind of, it's a bit, bit more manual, but yeah, th there are ways to, to do it, but maybe there could be an easier way that you could suggest. Any other, yep. What is the time box for releasing a new macro profile and release? Uh, approximately once every quarter. Uh, to, to begin with, it, it's kind of had, had a bit of a, a hiccupy ride um, just from going from an idea that a few people had to going into the Eclipse Foundation. That took up a lot of time, a lot of resources from a lot of people. Um, so since uh, kind of June-ish, we've kind of been speeding up and we, we are starting to hit that kind of uh, every quarter time box now. So we are expecting one more release this year and we are expecting another one first quarter next year. Um, that is the aim, but... Uh, Things always happen, don't they? Uh, so my time is up. So I think if you've got any more questions, probably the best thing is to um, come down and ask me, or you can just tweet me at Croft. So thank you very much for, for listening. <laughs>